is there scientific evidence that humans can project energy from their hands? Has that been scientifically studied and documented? Why, in fact, yes, it has been. And today we are going through that paper here on the Human Game Podcast. What do we do here if it's your first time here? This is a combination of science, spirituality, philosophy, much more. We do a lot around here, but what we're going to do today is go through this paper. Now, if you've never read a scientific paper, don't be scared because this one actually is done really, really well. I think it's 18 pages, right? So it's not that long. If I just summarize this, the video would be, and the podcast would be probably like five minutes long. So what I want to do is go through the paper and we will start with the abstract and then get into it. And you're going to learn a lot from this because again, they did this with philosophy. It's not just like a bunch of data, right? So check the bookmarks if you want to go to a specific spot. What we'll have as well is on the side of the screen, we'll actually have the paper going at the same time. So if you want to read along or if you want to look at the diagrams that we'll have, those will be on the screen. If you're listening and watching on Spotify or YouTube, you will have access to the video portion because that's what they allow. Apple Podcast is behind. Get your shit together. All right. So this paper. It's called Manipulation of the Electromagnetic Spectrum via Fields Projected from the Human Hands. A Qi Energy Connection? Question mark. It's by Randall L. Wachter, M.A., and Lauren Sergio, Ph.D. All right, so here's the abstract. The concept of qi energy has been an integral component of Eastern philosophy and medicine for thousands of years. While there is no precise Western definition of qi energy, it is often referred to as bioelectricity. It has been well established in the West that the electrical activity in the human body produces magnetic fields, which are sometimes referred to as bioelectromagnetic or bioEM energy. Technological advances over the past several decades have made it possible to measure these subtle yet important electromagnetic energy fields within and around the human body. Increasing evidence suggests that the Eastern concept of qi and the Western concept of bio-EM energy may be one and the same. An exploratory experiment was designed and carried out with the intention of providing further evidence of this connection. Three adult males were reported ex three adult males with reported extraordinary chi energy manipulation abilities projected chi energy towards copper coils that were designed to measure subtle alterations in the immediate electromagnetic environment. The results indicate that power increased or decreased significantly in the test phase at several frequencies when compared to the control phases. The analysis also indicated that the change in power for these specific frequencies was directional. That is, that these changes in power were mostly detected in one versus all three coils simultaneously. These results suggest that it is possible for human beings to alter the electromagnetic environment around their hands at will. Specifically, the power seen at certain frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum can be lowered or raised when a chi master emits chi energy versus simply holding his hand over a detection device during a control phase. Boom! And there it is. Okay, so that's the that's the substance, all right? That's the source there. Now let's get into the introduction. All right. And it explains how did they come to these conclusions? What is the science and the spirituality and the philosophy of it? All right. And I'm going to take drinks time to time. I'm not going to give you fancy stuff on the screen. It's not my style. I'm not interested in that. This is just true science done here. All right. So let's get into it. Introduction. All electric currents generate magnetic fields. The rate of current flow through the electrical coil determining the strength of the field. This phenomenon is known as the Hall effect, and it is an accepted physical law describing the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And by the way, I'm going to give my commentary throughout this. 
because I'm not just going to sit here and, and bot it and read a paper. So you can expect that. Okay. The Hall effect states that a magnetic field oriented in a certain way to the flow of an electrical current will direct the flow of charged particles to create a flow that is perpendicular to the original current. This effect works better for the semiconducting currents, which have fewer charged particles and are more mobile than conducting currents. Okay, stick with me. Alternatively, when an electric current flows through a conductor, a magnetic field is produced around the wire. So electric current flowing generates a magnetic field. And the strength of which is related to the amount of the current flow. So if there's more flow of electricity, you're going to get more magnetism and a, and a bigger magnetic field. It's also important to note that the magnetic field produced by the flow of current through a conductor, whether physical or biological, extends to infinite distance. The fields, much like circles of sound waves that become larger with distance as they move through space. So imagine, you know, your sonic boom, how it, it extends, right? We're that's what we're talking about here. And they become weaker in strength as they travel, just like you would imagine a boom does. Like if you have a plane flying and it hits his the sound barrier, right? It's a big boom, but the further are you away, the less it is. But it theoretically never ends. Okay. For instance, Dr. Harold Saxton Burr, Burr has measured what he calls L fields or the fields of life with electrodes placed a short distance from the skin. All, electri all electrical currents then, including those arising from living organisms, are accompanied by a magnetic field and are accompanied by magnetic fields that exist and interact throughout space. Every living organism is born, lives, and dies in a sea of electromagnetic radiation, and all life has evolved in an environment consisting of electromagnetic energy. As a result, the interactions that take place between all living organisms and electromagnetic energy are both crucial to life and are extremely complex. To deny interactions between electromagnetic fields and living things, quote, would be to deny the fundamental reaction upon which every living thing on the planet depends, namely the absorption of sunlight by green plants. End quote. Okay. And I'm making sure my throat stays, it stays nice and liquidized here because I've been reading a lot. We got the Bhagavad Gita we're doing as well. So my throat's a little bit sore. So if I pause for a second, I'm taking a drink, more than likely. Okay. And that's for those that are listening, because if you can see me, of course it makes sense, right? Based on the connection between electricity and magnetism, science, scientists hypothesize that the electrical currents produced by the heart would also produce heart magnetism. In 1963, Ball and McPhee used a pair of 2 million turn coils on the chest to pick up the magnetic activity produced by the heart. This was a major breakthrough concerning the relationship between living organisms and physical electromagnetic fields. The electrical activity that takes place in the human body produces magnetic fields, similar to the electrical activity that occurs in the physical environment. One of the philosophical debates that resulted from this discovery concerns, quote, the boundary between the organism and the environment. In the past, we could define an individual as that which lies within the skin. But it is a fact of physics that energy fields are unbounded. Technological advances over the past several decades have made it possible to measure these subtle yet important electromagnetic energy fields within and around the human body. And there's a reference for that. Studies are now explaining the biophysical mechanisms that enable human beings, including therapists, health practitioners, and martial artists, to sense and manipulate bioelectro. Right, it's bio EM, but I'm trying to remember what that is. It's bioelectromagnetic, right? Energy fields produced by their bodies and the implications of this manipulation. And by the way, a lot of the things that are being said, there are references for. I will include the references 
all by hand in the description if you want to check out those specific references. When it comes to specific references, I would also check to see if I've done a podcast on it because I'm planning on doing a lot of these and not just planning, I am going to do podcasts on a lot of these topics because it is extremely fascinating to me. All of this is. I love this shit. I really do. The study of bioelectromagnetic energy can teach us that the can teach us about the mechanisms of the smallest components of the human body, as well as the properties that arise from the complex interaction between these parts. Mm -hmm. This interaction refers to the, quote, property of wholeness, the integration that enables the parts to work together as a successful unit. The concept of wholeness or oneness has been generally disregarded in Western medicine and scientific inquiry in the past, but it is an integral component of Eastern medicine, philosophy, and scientific thought. In the East, the oneness that is crucial to the process of life is referred to as qi energy. Quote, for traditional Chinese medicine and philosophy, qi is a physical reality. However, from a Western scientific point of view, the existence of qi is an unproven, unclassified form of energy. Despite this widely held belief, Yang suggests that although there is no precise Western definition of qi, it is often referred to as bioelectricity. In fact, qi is actually the bioelectricity circulating in all things. According to traditional Chinese medicine, qi is life and is the absent and the absence of qi is death. To be truly alive and maximally healthy is to have qi in every part of the body and flowing through and beyond the body. To die is to be a body without qi. For health to be maintained, there must be a balance of qi, neither too much nor too little. The sources of qi energy include nutritional qi, air qi, and original qi. And there's references for that. Drink. Ah, okay. Original qi is that portion of qi energy that is inherent to us and was transmitted to us at conception from our parents. It cannot be replenished, and it is thought to slowly diminish in intensity over the course of our lives. Original qi is a basic pattern of our being, and such is critical to life. Upon death, this form of qi energy, like nutritional and air qi, ceases to flow throughout the body. Okay. Now we're moving on to the next part. In 1972, Harold Saxton Burr, an anatomist at the Yale School of Medicine proposed that human beings, and in fact all forms of life, are ordered and controlled by electromagnetic fields, which he had measured and mapped with precision. These fields of life, or L fields as Burr called them, quote, are invisible. I'm going I'm to start that again. These fields of life, or L fields as Burr called them, quote, are invisible and intangible, and it is hard to visualize them but a crude analogy may help to show what the fields of life do and why they are so important. Most people who have taken high school science will remember that if iron filings are scattered on a card held over a magnet, they will arrange themselves in the pattern of the, the quote, lines of force of the magnetic field. If the filings are thrown away and fresh ones scattered on the card, the new filings will assume the same pattern as the old. Something like this, though infinitely more complicated, happens in the human body. In short, Burr believed that electromagnetic fields produced by the body, what he called electrodynamic fields, are the basic blueprints for all living things and that the fields can be used to diagnose mental and physical conditions. This is very similar to the Chinese concept of original qi. Chinese philosophy teaches qi energy is an integral part of the world around us and can be projected externally from the human body. Recently, many scientists in the West have gone from a conviction that there is... Have gone... That's interesting. Recently, many scientists in the West have gone from a conviction that there is, quote, no such thing as energy fields in and around the human body to an absolute certainty that they exist using sensitive... 
magnetometers, scientists have measured the magnetic signature produced by the human heart at a distance of up to 15 feet in front of the body, resulting in a blurry distinction between an organism and its environment. Simultaneously, the organs and tissues that compose the human body interact with the electromagnetic fields in the environment. For example, it is known that the brain waves can be entrained by a widely cited phenomenon called the Schumann resonance. This phenomenon was described first by W.O. Schumann, a German atmospheric physicist. He hypothesized... He hy okay, we gotta start to say that word again. I messed it up with my tongue. He hypothesized that the space between the Earth and the ionosphere acts as a resonant cavity for lightning. The energy released by lightning strikes vibrate or resonate within the Earth ionosphere cavity in the extremely low frequency range, 1 to 40 hertz, which is an average frequency of 7 to 10 hertz. The average Schumann resonance frequency is similar to one of the four frequencies, or stages of electromagnetic activity recorded in the brain. Together, these four stages of brainwave activity are intimately linked by with stages of consciousness in human beings, from delta to theta, then alpha, and finally beta waves. Uh, okay. The range of resonant activity of the brain through all of these stages is about 1 to 50 hertz, with relatively little activity is see that is seen above 45 hertz. As such, it can be argued that the bioelectromagnetic activity seen in the human brain resonates within a range that closely corresponds to the range of electromagnetic pulsations of the Schumann resonance at 1 to 40 hertz. Brain waves are not constant in frequency, but vary from moment to moment. The brain's pacemaker determines the frequency of the brain waves at any given time, which is anatomically located in the thalamus. As a result of physiological constraints with the movement of calcium ions across the membrane of a neuron, these pacemaking th what word is that? Hold on. Thalamocortical neurons experience a silent phase every 1.5 to 28 seconds. During the cortical neurons experience with a silent phase every 1.5. Okay, whoop, I messed that up. Okay. During these thalamocortical silent phases, which can last between 5 to 25 seconds, the brain waves are said to be in a free run period and are susceptible to entrainment with outside fields. It is during these free run periods that the Schumann resonance may entrain human brain waves. With the onset of night, the ionosphere moves higher and the frequency of the Schumann resonance falls to the low range of the spectrum of 1 to 7 hertz. These frequencies entrain through the pineal gland and the overall brainwave activity during the free run period, resetting brainwave activity to between 1 and 7 hertz, which corresponds to the delta and theta stages of brainwave activity. These stages are associated with light and deep sleep and other stages of altered consciousness in humans. In this way, human behavior may be influenced by entrainment or absorption of electromagnetic fields from the environment. Because you might be asking, okay, side note, you might be asking yourself, how does this have to do with projecting G from your hands? Because it's giving you the concept that your body can be affected by things considered outside of you, right? By the Schumann resonance, it can affect your bioelectromagnetic fields. And so it's just one concept to relate to the concept that you could, in fact, manipulate your own electromagnetic fields from your hands. This paper is so fucking good. It's so good. Let's go. Uh, okay. Qigong masters have the ability not only to absorb qi from the environment, but also to manipulate qi energy at will. This manipulation involves projection of qi energy beyond the boundaries of their bodies, a feat known as external qi projection. The Chinese believe that external qi is merely the extension of one's internal qi. This projection of external qi can influence other living things as well as inanimate objects. For example, Eisenberg discusses a case 
where he witnessed a Qigong master project Qi energy from his hands, causing a fluorescent light bulb to glow. And there's a reference for that. It is believed that these Qigong masters manipulate the flow of internal Qi through the meridians in their bodies until the Qi is projected externally. Acupuncture and acupressure manipulation effects. Okay, what? I said that in the wrong tone. Acupuncture and acupressure manipulation affects a treatment for a certain illness by, or illnesses, by stimulating certain acupuncture points. Oh, man, I messed it up again. We got to restart. That's a weird sentence. For some reason, I'm not getting the tonation of that right. Acupuncture and acupuck. <laughs> Shit! Acupuncture and acupressure manipulation affects a treatment for certain illnesses by stimulating certain acupuncture points in an effort to enhance circulation through the meridians and promote the function of internal organs and the limbs through which the meridians run. It appears that acupuncture meridians, as described and utilized in traditional Chinese medicine, are electromagnetic in nature and so are vulnerable to disturbance by other magnetic or other electromagnetic energies. Woo! I gotta get back in the zone. We're not cutting this, right? There's no cuts. We're not cutting out the... Uh, uh. We're keeping them in, fuck it. Okay. Oshman explains that there are energetic circuits in the living organism in which electromagnetic information passes through on its way to every corner of the body. The flow of this energy is influenced by subtle energies in the environment and the disorders of tissues in the body influence the flow of these charges in consistent ways, as described by traditional Chinese medicine. These energetic circuits are referred to as the living matrix, a high-speed communication network that links all tissues and parts of the body with every other part resulting in an elegant and very efficient way of sending information throughout the body. Becker describes the connective tissue that surrounds all neurons in the body, called the perineum. That's not perineum, it's perin... Oh, that's it. I don't think I've heard of this one. Called the perineurium. It's not, it's not the perineum. It's perineurium. That's what we're going to say. P-E-R-I-N-E... U R I U M. As the second part of the, the dual nervous system in the body, the classic nerve network widely studied in the West, as well as the evolutionarily ancient perineural, perineural, perineural. Damn it! There it is. <laughs> Which operates on direct current. DC. Oscillations of the DC in the parent neural system are called brain waves, and one of the jobs of the system is to control the level of consciousness via connections with the pineal gland, thalamus, and reticular activating system. That's interesting. I've never heard of that, that particular word. Hmm. Studied a lot of shit, too. Okay. As it turns out, the best introduction of electronic circuitry of the human body is to be found in the study of acupuncture. The acupuncture meridians are actually low resistance pathways for the flow of electromagnetic information through the living matrix. These electromagnetic signals, like the Chinese concept of qi energy, then enter each and every organ, tissue, and cell of the body through the intracellular matrix between the cells and the cytoskeleton within the cells. Quote, the meridians are simply the main channels or transmission lines for electromagnetic signals in the continuous molecular fabric of the body. Some of these channels pass closer to the certain organs within the body, ultimately relaying the strongest part of any signal traveling along the meridian to the corresponding organ. In this way, the Chinese are able to influence the health of specific organs by manipulating the flow of qi energy along specific meridians. For almost 5,000 years, the Chinese have known that encouraging the flow of qi energy through the body could stimulate healing of broken bones and soft tissue damage, help to cure disease, prolong life, and prevent illness. And there's a reference for that. 
The enhancement of chi flow is facilitated by chi practitioners or healers who use various massage and touching techniques to enhance their patient's chi flow and introduce chi energy from their own bodies to the patient's bodies. Today in North America, medical research is demonstrating that medical devices that produce pulsing electromagnetic fields of, of particular frequencies can stimulate the healing of, variety, of a variety of tissues. These oscillating magnetic fields are being researched at various medical centers for the treatment of bone, nerve, and skin, capillary, and ligament damage. Research being conducted in the West is also demonstrating the importance of the messages that bio-EM fields or bioelectromagnetic fields send throughout the body for overall health and damage repair. These fields are thought to jumpstart the immune system into assisting in the repair of damaged tissue, including bone, nerves, and skin. Propagating or propagation of the bioelectromagnetic fields throughout the body via highly conductive pathways can be compared to the concept of chi energy flow through acupuncture meridians with the Chinese which the Chinese believe is crucial to maintaining health and injury repair. Woo! And we're only seven pages in. How, how long have we been going? 28 minutes or so? Probably like more like 25. Okay. That's pretty good. Coming up on halfway through, we'll probably be in a, what, an hour 15 if we keep up at the same pace. Interesting. You know what I like about this? Just a side note, my own commentary is I like that this paper is giving me science that backs up the science. It's not just saying, hey, bro, we projected this through our hands. Look at us. It works. <laughs> it's, do <laughs> it's doing something else, which is like, okay, here's the Schumann resonance. Here's all this science. Here's the science of meridians, which is a, it gives us a beautiful full understanding of connecting all the bridges of Western and Eastern, which is if you've been around on this podcast, you know that I love to do. I absolutely love it because there's so much wisdom in these philosophies and in these, the science of chi, right? And we're not just talking about that particular science. There's many other science. I mean, we talked about the Bhagavad Gita for a second earlier. That is a science of God realization. Right. So there's different types. And it's my honor to get to share this with you and let you decide. Remember, I'm not trying to tell you what it is and what it isn't, my friend. I'm just here to give you the information and trust that you can make that decision for yourself. Because there's too many people doing that. Oh, this is what it is for certain. That ain't me. That ain't me. All right. So we'll take that pressure off. I'm not trying to convince you anything. All right. Here we go. So now here will be another bookmark, the purpose of the study and hypothesis. Despite the abundant theoretical evidence supporting bioelectric energy as the Western scientific correlate to Xi energy, very few rigorously controlled scientific studies have examined this relationship. As such, an exploratory experiment was designed and carried out with the intention of providing such evidence. A Qigong healer will treat a deficiency in qi in a patient by taking qi energy from the environment and projecting it into the patient. Quote, masters of, oh, I don't want to mess this up, but I've not seen this word. Shiatsu, massage, do not merely sense and redirect the flow of qi. They transmit it from their own bodies into the patient's body by way of the appropriate meridian. Simultaneously, some martial artists project chi energy. Whoop, I hit the mic there. Some martial artists project chi energy into their opponents to cause a disruption in chi flow, which allows them to overpower the opponent. As such, the absorption, manipulation, and projection of chi is an integral part of tr traditional Chinese medicine and all theories of chi energy. Beautiful. If chi energy is the same phenomenon as bioelectric or bioelectromagnetic energy and can be manipulated and projected in a similar way, it should be possible to detect this projection of bio EM energy or chi energy with properly calibrated equipment. The detection of this energy and verification of its manipulation is the first step to further verifying the existence and importance of subtle electromagnetic fields in and around the human body. And if I'm reading that a little too fast, I am realizing I'm reading that fast. You can always slow me down, playback speed. 
If these fields can be manipulated and influence human tissues, as described in traditional Chinese medicine, the correlation of qi energy with bio-EM energy would be further supported. All electric currents generate magnetic fields, and the rate of current flow through the electrical coil determining the strength of the field, like we covered earlier. Alternatively, when an electric current flows through a conductor, a magnetic field is produced around the wire, the strength of which is related to the current flow. So they're just reiterating that first part, remember? Based on this knowledge, an experiment was devised using copper wire, copper wire coils. Individuals with purported extraordinary chi energy manipulation abilities were asked to protect or to project chi energy towards the copper coils. Any fluctuation in the magnetical in the magnetic fields around the coil would then alter the electrical current through the coil. It was hypothesized that the participants would be able to emit chi or bioelectrical bioelectric bio EM energy at will. And this energy would result in fluctuations in the current or the electrical current picked up by the coils. So basically, here's the thing. They're projecting it from their hands and they're basically seeing if the coils can detect that energy and there's controls and they're going to talk about that, right? All right, halfway there. There. Methods. Participants. Three adult males were reported ex with reported extraordinary chi energy manipulation abilities participated in the study. All participants had several years of experience in chi energy manipulation and were considered experts in their field. Informed consent was obtained from each participant after the nature and consequences of the experiment were explained prior to the initiation of the study. Apparatus. Passing an electrical current through a coil of conductive wire induces a directional magnetic field normal to the plane of the coil. The opposite is also true. A magnetic field that passes across a conductive metal coil will induce an electrical current in that coil. In this experiment, electromagnetic conversion was achieved using a custom three coil system to passively detect any directional magnetic fields in the immediate environment. Each coil was one inch in diameter and consisting of 80 turns of copper wire. The three coils were arranged orthogonally to each other and attached to a rectangular piece of wood. And see figure one, it says, now if you look on the screen, I'm gonna go to figure one just to see it. Okay, this is what they're talking about. I'll give you a little bit of that. So we've got figure one reads, coil arrangement and apparatus configuration for measurement of magnetic energy. Hand posture is for illustrative purposes only and does not reflect actual postures used in the study. Numbers refer to the coil number as referred in table one. Okay, so for those that can't see it, it looks like a, a standing rectangle, basically, that's connected to an amplifier that's connected to a PC or computer. Right, I'm pretty sure PC is. They're still calling it personal computer, right, brother? <laughs> now it says table one. Numbers refer to the coil number as reference in table one. I don't really think that's important. I don't think I want to spend time doing that. So, I mean, here's the meat and potatoes of the, of the study, right? So if you're listening, you really got to pay attention to understand this, I think. At least I know myself and I would. So the coils were attached to custom built electronic amplifiers, which allowed the detection of voltage as low as 0 0.049 volts across a band frequency of 0 to 100,000 hertz. That's a lot. The raw signals detected by the coils were collected at a sampling rate of 1,000 hertz and stored on a personal computer. Oh, nailed it. It is personal computer. <laughs> I've built my own computers before, and I remember when they were called PCs. Okay, data acquisition was controlled using custom written software, MS Visual C++. Okay, procedure. 
The three participants projected chi energy at the coils over three separate trials. Each trial consisted of an initial control period followed by a chi projection from the hands, remember, test period followed by a second control period. Each period, each period was 20 seconds long. Participants attempted to generate chi flow using different using a different method for each of the three trials. Additionally, participants attempted to elicit current flow from different coils. Trial activity and timing is summarized in table one. Okay, analysis, here we go. For this study, the data were subject to Fourier analysis between zero and 120 hertz. A fast Fourier transformation was performed on the signal currents collected from each coil separately in order to obtain the magnitude of chi measured as power at each frequency during control and test conditions. An initial examination of the data revealed signal artifact at a limited number of select frequencies due to electrical noise in the environment, power supplies, computer, video boards, etc. Therefore, extremely selective filter was applied to all data, whereby individual frequencies were removed if their mean power levels were more than 50 times greater than surrounding frequencies. These frequencies were 22 hertz, 60 hertz, and their harmonics, 44, 88, 120. Okay, that was, I was wondering that. How are they going to, what if, because th this is one of my questions with the study. What if when you projected it from your hand, that frequency was around the same frequency that the signal or the, the devices that they were using to measure it? Because how are they going to account for the noise? And so that answers this question. The average power was calculated in sections over a range of five successive frequencies following noise removal. For example, the mean power of signals generated between zero and five hertz was calculated and compared for significant differences in power between the control and test conditions for each trial. Then the same procedure was followed for six to 10 hertz range and so on. A one-way ANOVA, that's the acronym, was used to compare signal power levels collected during a 10 second control period at the beginning of a trial versus signal power levels collected during a 10 second test portion in the middle of a trial versus signal power levels connected during another 10 second control period at the end of the trial. Data were not combined across subjects as a preliminary analysis revealed significant differences between them. Each of these three coils was tested separately. All analysis were done using custom written software. And remember, we're reading a legit scientific paper, which means it's going to be scientific. So if you're like, this is boring, or you're like, oh, this is too complex, challenge yourself. Get that brain stimulated. Get it going. See if you can use the extra brain power to evolve yourself to understand this. Because I know there's going to be some people that are like, oh, this is too complex. It's just going over my head. Concentrate. Concentrate on this. And I... It, it'll only help you to do that because it'll be a brain practice in itself. Okay. But either way, these are the results. So it's not going to be as complex, but it might be for just a second that we'll summarize at the end. So if you're like, I can't handle this, there's going to be a conclusion. I would jump to that. Okay. But I'm disappointed. <clears throat> Voice crack. <laughs> I'm disappointed in you if you do. Just kidding. I love you. All right, there are three main results to the report. The first and most basic finding is that significant alterations, a P is less than 0 0.05 in power, were detected in the coils between the test and the control, control conditions. While the magnitude of these effects was not large, some interesting features were observed. Figure two illustrates that th Three examples of changes in mean power between test and control periods in a specific 5 hertz frequency bin. We found that the power could either increase, figure 2a, or decrease, figure 2b, within a certain frequency bin. We're going to jump to that real quick. Where's figure 2a and 2b? This is figure 2a and 2b. This is figure 2, table 2. Figure three. Okay, so it must be a part of figure two. Okay, figure two. Changes in power taken from FFT analysis between initial control period, test period, and second control period during chi generation. 
in three different subjects. Oh, they messed up that word. It says difference. It must be different. Each period represents the, and, and trust me, I'm terrible at grammar, so. <laughs> I'm not trying to say I'm great. <laughs> each period represents the mean power over the middle 10 seconds of each condition. Okay, and you can see that chart if you're seeing the visual. I'm going to give you like five more seconds with that. And pause it if you want. I'm going to keep going. Okay. No, I got to find my spot, mate. That is my spot. Okay, we're looking... I think it's right here. It is important to note that these changes in power between the test and control phases occurred for specific frequency ranges. That's important. And I'm not even just saying that because the sentence said that. I think that that's important. It occurred for specific frequency ranges. So the question is, is if you're projecting energy out of your hand, you want it to be, for, for scientific testing, you want it to be the same frequencies that are popping off when you do it, because that gives you the, the uh, repeatability that science likes, right? That scientific method of, okay, can we repeat it over and over? And so that's what we're looking for. And it did that. So table two summarizes these results across all frequency bins. And table two, I'm actually going to pause on table one if you didn't get that before. I'm going to pause. You can pause if you want to read it is what I'm saying. And I'm going to go to table two now. And those lists, for those listening, I don't think it's super important. This is for the, the, real, the real dense stuff. And there is all the results. All the power changes. Okay. Now we're going to get back into it. I'm trying to give you everything I can here. Okay. Second, we found that these changes in power for specific frequencies were directional. That is, that these changes in power were mostly detected in one coil during a test phase instead of all three coils simultaneously. For example, subject one showed a significant decrease in power on the test phase versus the control phase, or control phases between 400, between 45 and 50 hertz in coil three, or the upper coil. But there were no significant change in power for the other two coils, figure three. Lastly, and from my understanding, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but this, this part right here is talking about how in one coil, right? If you have three coils, he's trying to project it into one coil. That one coil is increasing. But the other ones are, it's, it, subject one showed a significant decrease in power on the test phase versus the control phases. So there was a, change in power it's it's interesting that it's a decrease right but that's what we're looking for if if he's projecting it into one right lastly the alteration in power during the test phase occurred within specific frequency ranges often for a given trial a subject would induce changes in multiple frequencies hence there was a change in the overall profile of the power levels across the frequency spectrum this is illustrated in figure four for one subject across zero to 101 hertz range. Note that the overall change in the power pattern across the spectrum, rather than a sharp spike at one specific frequency bin. Further, observe that this subject displayed a power increase in the one to 10 frequency range while the power decreases occurred in other frequency ranges. Similar patterns were observed in the other two subjects with certain frequencies increasing or decreasing in power while a few would change in the opposite direction. We found no consistent pattern across subjects. So that is fascinating, right? What they're saying is that certain frequencies increased and certain decreased. That's not something that I was expecting. Okay, so discussion. So they're going to explain this.
The salient. I don't even. I don't even know what that word means. Salient. Maybe it's just my smooth brain. The result of this experiment demonstrates that it is possible for human beings to alter the electromagnetic environment around their hands at will. Specifically, the power seen at certain frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. Ooh. I had saliva city there. <laughs> Specifically, the power seen at certain frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum can be lowered or raised when a chi master emits, quote emits, what he believes to be chi energy versus simply holding his hand over a detection device during a control phase. This suggests a link between willful chi energy production and manipulation of the electromagnetic spectrum. These these uh, oh that's they messed up that word too it's these data further support it's i think it would, it's supposed to be this data further supports the proposal that the concept of chi energy and bio em energy may be one and the same eastern healers and martial artists have been claiming the ability to alter chi flow by projecting chi energy from their hands for thousands of years it is it also appears that the directional influence of this change in power can be manipulated as power changes were observed in only one of the three spatial dimensions at a time. Interestingly, we did not observe a spike in a particular frequency, such as, such as one would see if measuring output from machinery, such as high energy radiation from an x-ray machine, for example. I'm going to take a drink. Rather, a subtle pattern change occurred across an array of frequencies. If indeed these power changes represent a willful manipulation of energy meant to affect another organism, a possible mechanism for such interaction may be a destabilization of that organism's equilibrium. That's interesting. Such disequilibria between systems can be seen, for instance, in the brain, where an, whereby an imbalance of neuro neural control system in a patient the basal ganglia for example can lead to neuropathological states such as parkinson's or huntington's disease while we do not purport to understand what system might be affected by these power alterations across the frequency spectrum woo, it remains an intriguing possibility that chi masters may affect healing in their patients by Re-equilibrating, re-equilibrating an unbalanced system, or a martial artist may affect a victim by de-equilibrating them in the same manner. Admittedly, the results of this experiment are controversial. This is a preliminary experiment and was designed to be exploratory in nature. Our original goal was to search for evidence of bioelectromagnetic energy and to see if th the subtle electromagnetic fields produced by the body and surrounding the human body could be manipulated at will. As such, we feel that we have accomplished our goal. At the very least, the data suggests that these individuals are somehow manipulating the electromagnetic spectrum across their hands. Their explanation for the results of the study is simple in concept, but complicated in practice. Like countless healers, martial artists, and Qigong masters throughout history, they are projecting qi energy onto the coil detectors. All right. In light of the significant results, there are limitations to the study, all of which we intend to address in future experiments. The first of these limitations and the simplest to remedy, is the behavioral variability of participants. As displayed in Table 1, the participants chose to try different techniques for each of the qi projection trials. These different techniques, all based on qi energy manipulation theory, were all designed to enhance qi flow. In future studies, participants will be asked to use a similar technique across all, proje all qi projection trials to control for variability. Secondly, it has been suggested that participants were able to alter the power of certain frequencies in the test phase versus the control phase by altering the muscle tone in their arm and hand and by moving their hand. 
It is well established that the muscle contractions alter electromagnetic fields. This is a big point. This is a big point. Secondly, movement of an electromagnetic field through space will influence existing background fields in that space. While this is a legitimate concern, we feel that this phenomenon did not influence the results of our experiment. First, we did not visually detect any movement of any of the participants' hands during the experiment. Secondly, we would expect to see widespread alterations in the power of many frequencies across three-dimensional planes with the movement of hands and contractions of numerous muscles in the arm and hand. As discussed, we mostly saw changes in only one of the coils at a time, representing a very specific one-dimensional alteration of electromagnetic frequencies. We, while we believe that the contraction of muscles and movement of the participants' hands do not account for the results, a future study will control for hand movement and muscle contraction more strictly by recording the participants' hand and arm closely and measuring for changes in muscle contraction between the test and control phases. There it is. Not, we're not done yet. Hold on. That's not what I meant. We're getting there. As is the nature of exploratory studies, we now find ourselves asking more questions than have been answered. Why are we seeing increases as well as decreases in power for specific frequencies? Are these chi masters able to suppress as well as enhance the power of specific environments and in an electromagnetic environment? Which is, by the way, side note, what, what I was getting at earlier. It's interesting how the energy decreased as well as increased in specific frequencies. It wasn't just a, a, an increase in a spike. It was very specific. And why is that happening? Can, can she, are they like taking, here's my question. Are they taking part of that other frequency and transforming that or alchemizing that bioelectrically? And then that is what's getting, that's the energy. You know how they're saying throughout the study that they're taking energy from the environment. Well, are they taking that frequency? That's the frequency that they're taking. Other frequencies that they're not able to manipulate, and we have no idea why that is, why they're have specific, why they able to manipulate specific frequencies. It probably has to do with the uh, chi energy fields or the bioelectromagnetic fields of the body. right? They, they, they're vibrating at specific hertz. What I'm saying is that I don't know why, and nobody can really say why that is, why those specific frequencies are chosen. All right, unanswerable. Okay. Why are we seeing changes in very specific frequencies versus, versus swaths of frequencies? Would we see the same changes in power if an individual who has never even heard of the concept of chi energy attempted to alter the electromagnetic spectrum around the coils? Future work will address these questions in more detail. Dot, dot, dot. And there it is. On the screen, you'll see the correspondence if you're watching YouTube, Spotify. And acknowledgements. I do want to read the acknowledgements. Just, uh, why not? The authors wish to thank Gordon Travers in memoriam and Sarah Daly of York Karate Do, Toronto, Canada, without whose support this project would have not occurred. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Gordon, for that. We further wish to thank Dr. I'm going to scuff this and it's okay. Zhao Gang Yan for his immeasurable technical assistance and Dr. Matthew J. Hayat for his statistical advice and comments on an earlier version of the manuscript. Lastly, we would like to thank three Qi masters who took time to participate in the study. All right. And I, I do want to just put an open invitation to anyone who was involved in the study. If you're like, hey, I want to. I saw your video. I want to come on or a podcast and I want to come on and discuss it myself and my thoughts on it. Open invitation. Reach out to me. Um, you can find that information. My link tree to reach out. Okay. And then there are a ton of references, right? And we're going to do shorter podcasts as well. This one is, wow, we got through that second half pretty quick. Is that only 57 minutes? Wow. Pretty good. Very good. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different references here. We're going to go through these in 
different videos. We may repeat some of the same things we talked about because having a specific video, this human resonance part could have a, its own podcast because that's actually really interesting. Oh, here's more references. So if you want to pause, so I'm going to do this. Okay, you want to pause. Here's reference one through 13. Okay. And here's 14 through 19. So 19 different references to go through for this study. So in conclusion, let me know what you thought of this study. I thought it was fascinating. Again, not trying to convince you. It is absolutely facts. We're not trying to do that. We're just going through the study. You come to your own conclusions. I love bridging, right? When we can get evidence of things for 5,000 years. 5,000. That's what it said in the paper. 5,000 years they have been practicing this. And we are now coming to the same conclusions that they did. What else have they been saying is my question. And guess what? The perfect segue. I do go through a lot of these texts. The Bhagavad Gita will be one of the main texts that we cover. Um, we have other texts coming. There's a lot of podcasts on the way. And if you're still here, I just want to let you know, just as a personal note, I haven't done enough content. It's not, I haven't done. I realize that I want to do more videos or more podcasts like this. This is a passion of mine. I can feel the energy while I'm doing this. I love it. Right. And so you're going to see a lot more of this. You're going to see a lot more of the reading of the spiritual text and the breakdown as well. I felt like this paper, I did do some commentary. I didn't do a whole lot because there really wasn't that much that wasn't explained pretty plainly. There was some parts, which I did my best to, to give you my, my simple take on it. And that's what I'm going to continue to do as I go through these different papers is if I feel like it wasn't explained in a way that's truly understandable because I don't like word salads, but I also understand you have to use technical information. So it's this interesting harmony of learning the language of how they speak, right? And I'm pretty happy with how well I read that. I didn't really screw it up that many times, which is just a win for me. So if you like this, podcast if you enjoyed this breakdown this is the first one we've done of this type here's a couple things let me know in the comments if you could drop a like for me if you're on youtube that'd be amazing i would absolutely appreciate that that's all i'm asking and if you could um subscribe stick around if you like this i'm sure you'll like the other things we're breaking down we do a variety of things here we're not putting ourselves in a box either so you can expect a variety and if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, if you could drop your boy a nice five-star review, that would be incredibly helpful to the channel and to getting this information to more people. Share it with your friends if it's interesting to you. That's what I've done. I've shared this paper with a lot of people already. So I think that's going to cover it for today's podcast. We will be back for other papers. And the last thing I want to ask is if you have a paper, right? If you have a paper that you think is worth breaking down or you have something in particular, we're also going to do books. We're going to do probably more summaries, right? I'm not going to read a whole book except maybe some of them, but only the ones that are like really, really, really top tier, right? Because it takes a lot of energy to read a book, but I'm going to do summaries of books too. If you have a book, if you have specific things that are related to this specific papers that I'm not aware of, I would absolutely love that. So I'm going to drop in the description or the show notes, a type form for you to fill out related to this. And that way, it, I would appreciate all the help on this research. I'm just trying to get this information out because I find it uh, beautifully fascinating and uh, wonderful that science is beginning to recognize these spiritual traditions, not as if the spiritual traditions are better in any way, but I think the magic is where we can meet the two, the science and the spiritual. The science and the metaphysical, you could say. And we don't have to make it this woo-woo stuff that people have said for a long time. We can make it understandable. And I think that's when society will evolve. Not when we have these like offshoot things, but when we can come together. And I hope that this will bring people together, this information and this commentary, so that we can see we are all in this together truly we're all trying to figure this out we all come in the same way we don't know what the hell's going on we all come in with no memory so let's try and figure it out together my friends all right i will see you in the next podcast thanks for listening to the human game podcast see you in the next one all right peace my friend